Chapter 10, I ruin a perfectly good bus. It didn't take me long to pack. I decided to leave the Minotaur horn in my cabin, which left me only an extra change of clothes and a toothbrush to stuff in the backpack Grover had found for me. The camp store loaned me $100 in mortal money and 20 golden drachmas. These coins were as big as Girl Scout cookies and had images of various Greek gods stamped on one side and the Empire State Building on the other. The ancient mortal drachmas had been silver, Charon told us, but Olympians never use less than pure gold. Charon said the coins might come in handy for non-mortal transactions, whatever that meant. He gave Annabeth and me each a flask of nectar and an airtight bag full of ambrosia court squares to be used only in emergencies, if we were seriously hurt. It was god food. Charon reminded us it would cure us of almost any injury, but it was lethal to mortals. Too much of it would make a half-blood very, very feverish. An overdose, overdose would burn us up, literally. Annabeth was bringing her magic Yankees cap, which she told me had been a 12th birthday present from her mum. She carried a book on famous classical architecture, written in ancient Greek, to read when she got bored, and a long bronze knife hidden in her shirt sleeve. I was sure the knife would get us busted the first time we went through a metal detector. Grover wore his fake feet and trousers to pass as human. He wore a green Rasta-style cap because when it rained, his curly hair flattened and you could just see the tips of his horns. His bright orange backpack was full of scrap metal and apples to snack on. In his pocket was a set of reed pipes his daddy goat had carved for him, even though he only knew two songs. Mozart's Piano Concerto No. 12 and Hilary Duff's So Yesterday both of which sounded pretty bad on reed pipes. We waved goodbye to the other campers, took one last look at the strawberry fields, the ocean and the big house, then hiked up Half Blood Hill to the tall pine tree that used to be Thalia, daughter of Zeus. Chiron was waiting for us in his wheelchair. Next to him stood the surfer dude I'd seen when I was recovering in the sick room. According to Grover, the guy was the camp's head of security. He supposedly, supposedly had eyes all over his body, so he could never be surprised. Today, though, he was wearing a chauffeur's uniform, so I could only see extra peepers on his hands, face, and neck. This is Argus, Charon told me. He will drive you into the city and uh, keep an eye on things. I heard footsteps behind us. Luke came running up the hill, carrying a pair of basketball shoes. Hey, he panted. Glad I caught you. Annabeth blushed the way she always did when Luke was around. Just wanted to say good luck, Luke told me. And I thought, uh, maybe you could use these. He handed me the sneakers, which, which looked pretty normal. They even smelled kind of normal. Luke said, Maya, white bird's wings sprouted out of the heels. Startlingly so much I dropped them. The shoes flapped around on the ground until the wings folded up and disappeared. Awesome, Grover said. Luke smiled. Those served me well when I was on my quest. Gift from Dad, of course. I don't use them much these days. His expression turned sad. I didn't know what to say. It was cool enough that Luke had come to say goodbye. I'd been afraid he might resent me for, forget, for getting so much attention the last few days, but here he was giving me a magic gift. It made me blush almost as much as Annabeth. Hey man, I said, thanks. Listen, Percy, Luke looked uncomfortable. A lot of hopes are riding on you, so just kill some monsters for me, okay? We shook hands. Luke patted Grover's head between his horns and gave a goodbye hug to Annabeth. It looked like she might pass out. After Luke was gone, I told her, you're hyperventilating. I'm not. You let him capture the flag instead of you, didn't you? Oh, why do I want to go anywhere with you, Percy? She stomped down the other side of the hill, where a white SUV waited on the shoulder of the road. Argus followed, jingling his car keys. I picked up the flag shoes. They had a sudden bad feeling. I looked at Chiron. I won't be able to use these, will I? He shook his head. Luke meant well, Percy, but taking to the air, that would not be wise for you. I nodded, disappointed. Then I got an idea. Hey, Grover, you want a magic item? His eyes lit up. Me. Pretty soon, we'd laced sneakers over his fake feet, and the world's first flying goat boy was ready for launch. Maya, he shouted. He got off the ground, okay, but then fell over sideways, so his backpack dragged through the grass. The winged shoes kept bucking up and down like tiny broncos. Practice, Charon called after him. You just need practice. Ah, Grover went flying sideways down the hill like a possessed lawnmower, heading towards the van. 
Before I could follow, Charon caught my arm. I should have trained you better, Percy, he said. If only I had more time. Hercules, Jason, they all got more training. That's okay. I just wish I stopped myself because I was about to sound like a brat. I was wishing my dad had given me a cool magic item to help on the quest. Something as good as Luke's flying shoes or Annabeth's invisible cat. What am I thinking, Charon cried. I can't let you get away without this. He pulled a pen from his coat pocket and handed it to me. It was an ordinary, disposable ballpoint. Black ink, removable cap, probably cost 30 cents. Gee, I said, thanks. Percy, that's a gift from your father. I've kept it for years, not knowing you were who I was waiting for. But the prophecy is clear to me now. You are the one. I remembered the field trip to the Metropolitan Museum of Art when I vaporised Mrs. Dodds. Charon had thrown me a pen that turned into a sword. Could this be? I took off the cap, and the pen grew longer and heavier in my hand. In half a second, I held a shimmering bronze sword with a double-edged blade, a leather-wrapped grip, and a flat hilt riveted with gold stubs. It was the first weapon that actually felt balanced in my hand. The sword has a long and tragic history that we need not go into, John told me. Its name is Anaclusmus. Riptide, I translated, surprised the ancient Greek came so easily. Use it only for emergencies, Charon said. And only against monsters. No hero should harm mortals unless absolutely necessary, of course. But this sword wouldn't harm them in any case. I looked at the wickedly sharp blade. What do you mean it wouldn't harm mortals? How could it not? The sword is celestial bronze, forged by the Cyclops, tempered in the heart of Mount Etna. Cooled in the river Leith, it's deadly to monsters, to any creature from the underworld, provided they don't kill you first. But the blade will pass through mortals like an illusion. They simply are not important enough for the blade to kill. And I should warn you, as a demigod, you can be killed by either celestial or normal weapons. You are twice as vulnerable. Good to know. Now, recap the pen. I touched the pen cap to the sword tip, and instantly, Riptide shrank to a ballpoint pen again. I tucked it in my pocket. A little nervous because I was famous for losing pens at school. You can't, Charon said. Can't what? Lose the pen, he said. It is enchanted. It will always reappear in your pocket. Try it. I was wary, but I threw the pen as far as I could down the hill and watched it disappear in the grass. It may take a few moments, Charon told me. Now check your pocket. Sure enough, the pen was there. Okay, that's extremely cool, I admitted. But what if a mortal sees me pulling out a sword? Charon smiled. Mist is a powerful thing, Percy. Mist? Yes. Read the Iliad. It's full of references to the stuff. Whenever divine or monstrous elements mix with the mortal world, they generate mist, which obscures the vision of humans. You will see things just as they are, being a half-blood, but humans will interpret things quite differently. Remarkable, really, the lengths to which humans will go to fit things into their version of reality. For the, f I put Riptide back in my pocket. For the first time, the quest felt real. I was actually leaving Half-Blood Hill. I was heading west with no adult supervision, no backup plan, not even a cell phone. Sharon said cell phones were traceable by monsters. If we used one, it would be worth than sending up a flare. I had no weapon stronger than a sword to fight off monsters and reach the land of the dead. Sharon, I said, when you say the gods are immortal, I mean, there was a time before them, right? Four ages before them, actually. The time of the Titans was the Fourth Age, sometimes called the Golden Age, which is definitely a misnomer. This, the time of Western civilization and the rule of Zeus, is the Fifth Age. So what was it like before the, gar before the gods? Charon pursed his lips. Even I am not old enough to remember that child, but I know it was a time of darkness and savagery for mortals. Kronos, the Lord of the Titans, called his reign the Golden Age because men lived innocent and free of all knowledge. But that was mere propaganda. The Titan King cared nothing for your kind except as appetizers or a source of cheap entertainment. It was only in the early reign of Lord Zeus, when Prometheus, the good Titan, brought fire to mankind, that your species began to progress, and even then Prometheus was branded a radical thinker. Zeus punished him severely, as you may recall. Of course, eventually the gods warmed to humans, and Western civilization was born. 
But the gods can't die now, right? I mean, as long as Western civilization is li- alive, they're alive. So even if I failed, nothing could happen so bad it would mess up everything, right? Charon gave me a melancholy smile. No one knows how long the age of the West will last, Percy. The gods are immortal, yes. But then, so were the Titans. They still exist, locked away in their various prisons, forced to endure endless pain and punishment, reduced in power but still very much alive. May the fates forbid the gods should ever suffer such a doom, or that we should ever return to the darkness and chaos of the past. All we can do, child, is follow our destiny. Our destiny, assuming we know what that is. Relax, Jaron told me. Keep a clear head and remember you may be about to prevent the biggest war in human history. Relax, I said. I'm very relaxed. When I got to the bottom of the hill, I looked back. Under the pine tree that used to be Thalia, daughter of Zeus, Charon was now standing in full horseman form, holding his bow high in salute. Just your typical summer camp send-off, by your typical centaur. Argus drove us out of the countryside and into Western Long Island. It felt weird to be on a highway again. Annabeth and Grover sitting next to me, as if we were normal carpoolers. After two weeks at Half Blood Hill, the real world seemed like a fantasy. I found myself staring. At every McDonald's, every kid in the back of his parents' car, every billboard and shopping mall. So far, so good, I told Annabeth. Ten miles, and not a single monster. She gave me an irritated look. It's bad luck to talk that way, seaweed brain. Remind me again, why do you hate me so much? I don't hate you. Could have fooled me. She folded her cap of invisibility. Look, we're just not supposed to get along, okay? Our parents are rivals. Why? She sighed. How many reasons do you want? One time, my mum caught Poseidon with his girlfriend in Athena's temple, which is hugely disrespectful. Another time, Athena and Poseidon competed to be patron god for the city of Athens. Your dad created some stupid salt water spring for his gift. My mum created the olive tree. The people saw that her gift was better, so they named the city after her. They must really like olives. Oh, forget it. Now, if she'd invented pizza, that I could understand. I said... Forget it. In the front seat, Argus smiled. He didn't say anything, but one blue eye on the back of his neck winked at me. Traffic slowed us down in Queens. By the time we got into Manhattan, it was sunset and starting to rain. Argus dropped us at the Greyhound station on the Upper East Side, not far from my mum and Gabe's apartment. Taped to a mailbox was a soggy flyer with my picture on it. Have you seen this boy? I ripped it down before Annabeth and Grover could notice. Argus unloaded our bags, made sure we got our bus tickets, then drove away. The back on the, the eye on the back of his hand opening to watch us as he pulled out of the parking lot. I thought about how close I was to my old apartment. On a normal day, my mum would be home from the candy store by now. Smelly Gay was probably up there right now playing poker, not even missing her. Grover shouldered his backpack. He gazed down the street in the direction I was looking. You want to know why she married him, Percy? I stared at him. Were you reading my mind or something? Just your emotions, he shrugged. Guess I forgot to tell you satyrs can do that. You were thinking about your mum and your stepdad, right? I nodded, wondering what else Grover might have forgotten to tell me. Your mum married Gabe for you, Grover told me. You call him smelly, but you've got no idea. The guy has his aura. Yuck, I can smell him from here. I smell traces of him on you, and you haven't been near him for a fortnight. Thanks, I said. We're the nearest shower. Should be grateful, person. Your stepfather smells so repulsively human he could mask the presence of any demigod. As soon as I took a whiff inside his Camaro, I knew. Gabe has been covering your scent for years. If you hadn't lived with him every summer, you probably would have been found by monsters a long time ago. Your mum stayed with him to protect you. She was a smart lady. She must have loved you a lot to put up with that guy. That makes you feel any better. It didn't, but I forced myself not to show it. I'll see her again, I thought. She isn't gone. I wondered if Grover could still read my emotions, mixed up as they were. I was glad he and Annabeth were with me, but I felt guilty that I hadn't been straight with them. I hadn't told them the real reason I'd said yes to this crazy quest. The truth was, I didn't care about retrieving Zeus's lightning bolt, or saving the world, or even helping my father out of trouble. The more I thought about it, I resented Poseidon for never visiting me, never helping my mum never even sending a lousy child support check. 
He'd only claimed me because he needed a job. All I cared about was my mum. Hades had taken her unfairly and Hades was going to give her back. You will be betrayed by the one who calls you a friend. The oracle whispered in my mind. You will fail to save what matters most in the end. Shut up. I told it.